for CSE 116, right? Okay. So the first thing we need to know, CSE 116. First thing we need to know is I just did 312 and I'm going to 312 after this, so I actually have to think about it. Um, the, uh, the first thing we need to know is how to get all the information that we want. The course website, which is, and I made this as easy as I can possibly make it. I've thought of ways to make it, of making it simpler. I can't think of anything. It's CSE116.com. I don't think I can make it any simpler. So nobody should ever ask me, what's the course website? It's CSE116.com. You just have to remember what course you're registered for and then slap.com at the end of it. Easy as can be. Uh, this is where you're going to find everything you need to know for the course with, uh, I guess, one exception. The classroom recordings, the room is recording this lecture right now. Uh, that lecture is automatically going to go to Panopto on UB Learns or Brightspace, whatever you want to call it. Uh, so the lecture recordings are going to show up in, uh, in UB Learns. That's the only thing we're using UB Learns for. Everything else can be found from the course website. It's going to be linked from here. And, you know, why don't I just add a link to UB Learns here? I probably will have to just add a UB Learns link, too. Um, then I can say everything's right here. So let's go through this one at a time and figure out what we're in for for this semester. So first, uh, Autolab. Those of you who took 115 here know what this is all about already. Um, but the first thing, you're submitting your program assignments to, through Autolab. This is a system where you make your programming submissions. The system will take your code, it'll run my auto grader on it, and spit out your score and your feedback. You can submit as many times as you want before the deadline, and Autolab will keep uh, giving you your latest score and feedback. So that's where we're going to submit all of our programming assignments. Uh, I'll talk a lot more about that, you know, once, actually I won't really. Uh, but once the homework assignments come out, that'll be more pertinent, and you can ask any questions you have. It's pretty straightforward. Uh, you create a zip file of your project, and then throw it in Autolab, and it'll spit out a score. If you try to go there right now, it won't work, and that's because Paul didn't set it up right, who I was just talking to down here. And the one thing you need to know is if anything is broken about the course, it was Paul's fault. He did it. Everything bad is his fault. If there's anything you like about the course, of course I did that part, so. Um, and uh, uh, joking a bit, but we do have a separation of concerns. Anything related to lab is in Paul's domain, so we'll talk about it when we get through the syllabus, but anything in lab, which it will mo primarily be quizzes and interviews, uh, Paul's in charge of all that stuff. So if you ask me a question, I might just straight up say, talk to Paul, email Paul, uh, bug Paul. I'll say one of those three things. If it's related to the programming assignment, so anything in Autolab, if Autolab is spitting out something, uh, something you don't like or you don't understand, uh, that's going to be in my camp. And if you ask Paul about those things, he's going to send you to me. Uh, so we are kind of co-teaching. Obviously, you register for my section, so I, you're more of my problem than Paul's. But for lab stuff, I might say uh, email him or something like that. Um, there are four sections of 116 this semester. He's teaching three of them, and I'm teaching just this one. So. Uh, so we do both have, you know, uh, stake in the course. I don't know. But, uh, but yeah, I'm doing all the program assignments, which uh, might be the bigger headache of the course. So you'll probably be blaming me more than him anyway. Uh, next is GitHub. This is where every, uh, all the code that I show in lecture in the slides should be in this repo. On very rare occasions, I forget to update the repo when I uh, update an example. Uh, and then sometimes I even fix it during lecture or whatever, but you should have the latest code. So if you see code in my slides, you should be able to go to this repository and find that code and be able to play around with that code, get it on your laptop, change it, play around with it, see how it behaves, run it, uh, whatever you want to do with it. And I do recommend doing that as we're going through lecture examples. Play with the code yourself and see if it does what I claim it's, it's supposed to do. Change it. Predict how that change is going to affect it. You know, just tinker with the code and uh, play around with it as we go. The next three links, these are all from Paul's section. Paul does live coding in his lectures for just about every single lecture. Uh, my style is more slides and less live coding. His is, I think, 100% live coding. I don't think he knows how to open PowerPoint or present a slide, uh, which are two very different styles. 
Uh, and the advantage, I always say this is an advantage because we co-teach this course fairly often, um, is the lecture recordings for all four lectures are going to be in Panopto. You can go to UB Learns and access all of his lectures and my lectures. So if you're watching my lectures and you're just like, man, these slides are killing me, uh, go watch Paul's lectures and get that other perspective. If you're watching Paul's lectures uh, and uh, you're in my section, why would you be? Anyway, but you can watch either, either one. Um, so if my style just isn't gelling for you, feel free to check out his lectures. You're going to see sections A, C, E, and B. This is B, and for some reason there's no D. I don't know why. But uh, A, C, and E are his lectures, and then B is this lecture. Uh, so feel free to check all those out. And these, if you're going to check out his lectures, this is his coding. He'll pull up the repo. He'll code and then push his changes to the repo. If you don't, haven't heard the word repo, uh, short for repository before, that's a, a place where we store code in, on the internet. That's as succinct as I can say that without having to explain Git and all that. Um, so uh, he'll code in this and then push his code to these. So after each lecture, these should be live with the code that he did that lecture. And you can watch the video, pull up the code, and, uh, and do you know, whatever works best for your learning style, however you learn the best. Either if you watch my lectures and you're just like, man, I fully understand everything, then don't mess with any of Paul's stuff. But it's here if you want it. Memory diagram reference. Uh, this is everything to do with memory diagrams. Um, oh my goodness, this is the first time I, I get to do this. So you, if you took 115 last semester, if you're a transfer student, you're, you'll you have to pick this stuff up pretty quick. Um, but 115 last semester was the first time they did memory diagrams in 115. You're probably aware that they probably talked about the changes. So this is the first time that I get to assume you just know what memory diagrams are, which is freaking fantastic. Uh, I used to have to teach memory diagrams from scratch in 116. Uh, so you know what memory diagrams are. All of the lab quizzes are going to be memory diagram quizzes. The first thing that we're going to add to your current memory diagram knowledge is the heap. Uh, you've done, I think, a little bit of heap. You had to put your data structures on the heap in 115. Uh, but we're going to start doing more heap stuff uh, is the first new memory diagram stuff you'll learn. Uh, but here's a, a reference. All the stuff that we're going to do related to memory diagrams, there's examples of each concept in there. Uh, then YouTube, this is where I put uh, past videos from previous semesters. I, I'm on the fence right now whether I'm going to do it this semester or not. I don't know if it's worth the effort or not putting this semester's lectures on YouTube. But at the very least, you're going to have the past lectures. I've been putting my videos on YouTube for years, I don't know, a long time. So you can look at the past few iterations of 116. Not too much has changed since the previous lecture. So watching last semester's lectures, a lot of them are going to be about the same as this semester. So if you want to get ahead on the content, you have all of last semester's lectures available to you. You can uh, feel free to watch those and uh, get ahead on whatever you want. Piazza. Uh, I assume you're mostly familiar with how Piazza works to ask questions, make private posts. If you're posting code to Piazza, make sure it's private to instructors. And then uh, myself and all the TAs will be able to see that and answer a question. If you're posting code, never post it publicly. Obviously, posting uh, code solutions to the entire class is an academic integrity concern, so uh, just avoid that. But you can ask questions here. But also, this link is going to take you directly to, oh my god. Oh, is going to take you directly to the office hour schedule. Uh, so uh, it's pretty bare right now. I think Paul's the only one with his office hours up right now. Um, but uh, as the first few weeks uh, come and go, as we all get settled down, as our schedules settle down, mo most importantly, uh, we're going to add our office hours to that, myself, Paul, and all the TAs of which we have 47. There are 47 TAs to run this course. So there's going to be a lot of office hours up there. Uh, that uh, uh, You can find those office hours there. If you're going to office hours, make sure you check the schedule before you make a trip. The schedule is dynamic, especially in these first few weeks. Things are, things are going to be pretty well in flux. Uh, so make sure you check the schedule before making a trip to campus. All the office hours will be in Davis Hall outside of room 302, like in the, in the common lounge area outside of 302, I think is the room number. 
And uh, yeah, just make sure you check the schedule. Sometimes TAs, unfortunately, have to cancel. Um, sometimes they're rearranging their schedule. Things happen. Just make sure you check the schedule before you make the trip. That's all I really got to say about that. Uh, and finally, Discord. So we have a Discord uh, that you can join. Uh, I've been using this same Discord server for uh, ever since COVID, so since 2020. Uh, since 2020. And uh, by, you know, which implies that there are a lot of students there, a lot of alumni, uh, a lot of uh, the current TAs, past TAs, uh, just a lot of people in there. And uh, some of the, uh, there's a few past TAs that were still pretty active in the Discord as well. Uh, so if you have any questions, I always recommend this. Um, if you have any questions for your fellow students, for you know the juniors and seniors especially who just went through what you're about to go through, uh, questions about what to expect, what to expect from 220 and 250. If you've already heard horror stories from those courses, that don't believe them. Don't believe it all at all. Um, but they are tough. Believe them a little bit. Uh, but if you want to know if the rumors are true, ask them uh, how career prospects are, how to get internships, whatever. Uh, there's a huge wealth of knowledge in there, uh, just waiting to be tapped. The, there are so many people in there that would be happy to answer any questions. So uh, feel free to take advantage of that. If you see TAs, I have to give this a disclaimer because I almost got in trouble one semester. Uh, if you see TAs in there and they're acting less than professional, that's okay. Uh, when the TAs are in Discord, they are not working in any official capacity. They are just fellow students. They're just another student in there. Uh, so one, don't ask them coding questions. Don't ask them any programming questions in Discord. Uh, feel free to still ask those questions like in the general chats, like in the 116 channel. Go for it. Like, you can ask your, your questions. Uh, don't expect the TAs to answer them, but fellow students might. You can have discussions about the course, obviously. It's part of why it's there. Uh, and especially don't DM the TAs or myself coding questions. If you feel inclined to do that, just head over to Piazza. That's what Piazza's for. Discord is supposed to be more of a casual environment uh, where you can just kind of hang out. Um, no TAs get paid to monitor Discord in any official capacity, so I don't expect them to behave any specific way. And I can't really uh, technically, you know, I mean, I could, but I, I'm not really going to enforce any behavior on them when they're not working for me. They're technically not on the clock. Um, so just don't be surprised if they act less than professional. If they're acting less than professional on Piazza, let me know and I will bring down the hammer. But geez, uh, on Discord, I'm, they're, just, they're just people. Uh, the one exception to this, there is one, well, not really exception to what I just said, but there's one official capacity that I'll use Discord for, and that's during lecture. I'm going to have my phone open on the lecture channel. So I'll watch the lecture channel. If you want to ask questions during lecture, of course, you can throw your hand up and do the old-fashioned way. But if you don't want to do that, um, feel free to post in lecture. I'll watch it during, during lecture. It doesn't have to just be questions for class, but that's the initial intent. Um, that if you have a question that you want to ask, maybe I'm messing something up, maybe I'm on the wrong slide or something, or I don't know, uh, whatever I'm doing uh, bad, or maybe I just explained something really horribly and you want me to take another shot at it, give me another chance to help you understand whatever I'm covering, uh, hit me up in chat or, or whatever, you know, whatever you want to uh, post there. Uh, if things get too crazy, you know, each lecture, each section tends to take advantage of this to different degrees. Uh, if it does get too wild, there is also a lecture off-topic channel. So if there's just too much going on in there, I might be like, hey, you know, you can take that to lecture off-channel, um, uh, or lecture off-topic. Uh, because since I will be watching it during lecture, if there's just too much stuff going on and it's mostly just like memes going back and forth, um, I'm going to start ignoring it, and then I might miss a legitimate question. So if there's too much stuff that's just way off the topic and not uh, related to what I'm talking about, if it's related to what I'm talking about, even if it's a meme, I don't care. Uh, but if it's not related to what's going on in lecture. Um, but uh, I very rarely have to, have to enforce that. Uh, okay. We got through all these links. Any questions so far? You know, we really haven't talked about the course at all yet. But any questions about this? All right. Let's get into syllabus. So the, in, I don't think any current 115 instructors say this, but I always used to say this. Uh, I haven't been on 115 in a while, but I always just say 
Uh, what you learn in 115, and I wholeheartedly believe this, what you learn in 115 is everything you need to do to write a program that does anything. Like you can do anything with what you know from 115. We taught you all of the core concepts of programming. Actually, maybe this is a little less true because they got rid of the web stuff and the database stuff. Um, but still, um, I, I think you can do anything with you know, your control flow, your loops, variables, functions, uh, a couple of data structures. Like you can do anything with that stuff. So what else is there to learn? Like what, what are we here for then? What else are you going to learn? Uh, well, you can do anything, technically, but it's going to be very difficult, especially when the programs get very large. So the strong focus on 116 is what happens when you have larger programs? What happens, like, because most of what you did in 115 didn't, probably didn't break 100 lines of code. What happens when you break that 100 lines of code? What happens when you have a project that's, say, 1,000 lines of code, which probably, I should probably measure that at some point, but I, I assume that's true for any student. At the end of 116, you have a project that's 1,000 lines of code. Uh, Call me out on that if we get to the end of the semester, and that's not true. Um, but you're going to have a larger project, and how do we write a lot of pieces of code that interact with each other? How do we organize this code? How do we uh, reduce the redundancy? How do we reuse code? Like the first thing that you learn in 115 uh, uh, regarding that topic is write a function that you can call multiple times. We're going to expand that to classes, inheritance, polymorphism. How do we share code uh, more effectively across our different modules in our project? Uh, so that's a lot of what we're, we're going to learn. Uh, also, testing is going to be a huge part of the course. Probably, I don't want to scare you or anything, but probably the most frustrating part of the course for most students. Um, and that's kind of the nature of testing, I guess. I shouldn't lead with that. The unit testing is really fun. You're going to love it. Uh, I <laughs> uh, but how to test your code, which is answering the fundamental question of how do you know your code's right? Which is where it gets frustrating, because that is a tough question. Uh, that's where it can be, I shouldn't say frustrating, but challenging. How do you know your code's right? Well, you just submit to Autolab, Auto and Autolab tells you if it's right or wrong, right? How would you do that if you didn't have Autolab? And that's what we want to talk about with unit testing. If it's just you and your code, and you're working for a client, and your customer wants working code, how do you verify that your code is correct before shipping your code to the customer, before releasing that, that game? that hopefully doesn't have bugs. How do you know it doesn't have bugs? How do you test for things? So that's what we want to talk about with unit testing. Very challenging aspect of programming. Uh, OOP, we'll talk a lot about that. And data structures and algorithms. You know a couple data structures and some algorithms. We're going to learn more of them. My expectations, the big one is that you invest a minimum of 12 hours per week for 116 alone. Uh, this, and this is a minimum, and uh, I always feel weird saying this because I know you hear this in just about every course, and for a lot of courses, especially non-technical courses, th this isn't true. Like, you don't have to actually spend 12 hours on, on this. Um, 116, it's, let me be careful with my wording, it's going to be more true than with other courses. Obviously, if you did, like, um, um, a lot of programming in high school and you already know a lot of the stuff that we're going to cover, uh, you could probably get under this, this number. But if you know the 115 material, and you know the 115 material well, but you don't know anything beyond that yet, I think 12 hours per week is the number. Uh, and that's what I aim for designing the homework assignments and stuff. That's the number that you, you'll, you're expected to have to put in to do well in this course. Uh, if you are not completely proficient in all of the 115 concepts, this number is going to be higher for you. you because Not because this course just got harder, it's because you have to spend time learning that 115 stuff. You're not just off the hook because, oh, I squeaked by 115 with a C, so I'm ready for 116. No, you still have to learn that stuff. Uh, if you didn't do any programming or studying over the break, which I don't blame you at all for that, uh, but this number will be higher there as well. If you knew all of 115, but you forgot some of it over the break, you know, you're already behind that 12 hours per week is going to be higher. If the first few weeks, the first programming test deadline, I, I think is week five? I, I don't remember. But it, it's not in the first couple of weeks. So if those first couple of weeks, you don't do any programming outside, you don't do anything outside of class, 
you're stacking up these hours. Like, I don't have to show you all the math and everything, but you're stacking up those hours, and then that week of the deadline, if you haven't done anything until then, obviously that week you might be spending 40 hours uh, finishing that, that programming task. Um, so this is an average. If you're slacking a few weeks, that's catching up to you in the uh, future weeks. And I've had uh, you know, students say, oh yeah, I spend 40 hours a week just on 116. And then I ask them, well, what'd you do the first five weeks of class? Well, nothing. Well, yeah, if you do the math, it's averaging out. Uh, so, uh, so expect to have to put in time. 116 does take a time investment. The course has a reputation for being difficult, and it is quite a bit more difficult than 115. Uh, I'd like to fight back on that a little bit and say it's time consuming. It's just going to take time to learn these concepts. The concepts are, um, they, they um, what do I want to say? You're, you're not just going to understand them on one pass. It's going to take you a while to first understand the concept and then to take that leap into being able to apply that concept into brand new code that you write. Uh, you know, that takes some time to be able to do. It's going to take some practice. Okay, uh, so that's my big expectation. Um, I expect that you want to be here. That, that should go without saying. Uh, you took 115, you knew what, found out what programming was about, you realized you know, whatever con misconception you had before 115, you're, that's already gone. Uh, you know what programming is about and you voluntarily chose to take a second CSE course, so I expect you want to be here. Like, why else would you be here? You don't have to be here. You, you want to be here. Uh, in 115, that's not necessarily true. Some people stumble into 115 not knowing what they're doing, but you know what you're signed up for. You know what you're in for. And uh, you should be participating in every lecture and lab. Oh, and I should, uh, just to make sure, read this out loud. Uh, the 12 hours per week, you have three hours of lecture, two hours of lab. That's five hours right there already. So this is seven hours outside of lecture. And designing the programming tasks, I take that into account. If, uh, if it's a one-week task, most of them are one-week tasks, that's going to be a seven-hour. I'm going to aim for seven hours for a reasonable student who's keeping up with the content to be able to finish that. Then obviously more for somebody who's falling behind on the content, and less if you're ahead, if you already studied this stuff uh, before you got here. Some CC 115 review, I'm not going to dwell on that. Uh, check it out if you need it. Okay. Any questions at this point? Let's get into the grading structure. So this course uses a, I'll generously say, a different grading structure. I think it's the best grading structure ever. Um, but it takes a while to explain. We're going to have to probably take the rest of the time here just to explain how grading works in this class. So grading is split into two main learning objectives, OOP and data structures and algorithms. And then testing kind of is woven throughout all of the programming tasks. So we got two major topics, OOP and data structures and algorithms, uh, that we're going to learn. And to prove that you've completed the learning objectives of the course, which are broken into these bullet points, is uh, through three different types of assessments. So to prove that you have completed this learning objection, objective, for example, uh, this is the read with code, um, the concept of OOP. Can you read, explain, and write applying this concept? So can you read code? This is going to be your memory diagram quizzes. So every quiz is a read learning objective. Every interview, you're going to have interviews in lab. The TA will take you for about 10 minutes each, actually maybe a little less this semester because we've restructured some things, maybe like five to eight minutes. Uh, they'll ask you questions about the topic and uh, make sure that you understand what's going on with that topic. Can you have a technical conversation with another human being about the topic? If you can, you can play this learning objective. And write, this is your typical just programming tasks. Can you write programs? And each of these three, OOP and data structure and algorithms, are further split into three separate topics. OOP is classes, inheritance, and polymorphism. Data structures and algorithms is split into the three data structures that will, ooh, I have to update this, linked lists, trees, and graphs, which is notably absent from this. Oh. I have it right here, though. And graphs, those are the three data structures that we're going to learn in, in depth. 
Uh, I have to add graphs to quiz and interview here. So that's a total of six quizzes. A total of six interviews. And a total of eight programming tasks. These are the learning objectives of the course. And being the learning objectives of the course is what you need to learn to get the value out of this course, the educational value. So if you complete all of these learning objectives, you pass the class. If you don't complete every single one of them, it will be an F in 116. So this is our way, my and Paul's way, of saying, Paul's way if you don't like it. Uh, this is our way of saying, you need to be able to do these things to pass the class. And there's a lot of reasons for this, but to keep it kind of succinct, if you don't know all of these things, like because each one of these topics, and we trim this down to the topics that really are core that you need to know leaving this class. On, uh, in May, leaving 116, if you're going on to 220 and 250, these are the things that you need to know. And all of these topics will be necessary in 220 and 250 and beyond. Uh, if you don't complete all these, if there's anything in here that you're just not able to get by the end of the semester, I don't think you will pass next semester. I don't think you're going to get through 220 and 250. If there's anything in here, because these topics are easier compared to the topics in those courses, and these topics are required to understand what's happening next. Uh, and I don't want to see anybody set up in a position where they go on to next semester, to take 220 and or 250, and are not prepared for that, because then you're going to fail. You're going to fail next semester. Uh, and I've never seen a student, nowhere in the history of academia, has a student ever gotten into that situation and said, you know what I really need is to go back and retake 116 voluntarily. Nobody ever, ever does that. So to avoid you getting in a situation where you, basically your whole career is jammed up and you can't progress any further, uh, you know, it, it seems harsh on the surface. I know that. I understand that. But spending more time in 116, getting that foundation built the way it's supposed to be built, and then moving on to the next classes. So you need to learn all of this stuff, complete all of the learning objectives to pass the course. And I do. I really mean that. I know it looks tough on the surface. Uh, I'll start explaining this, and, and uh, hopefully you'll agree that it's not quite as harsh as it seems. Uh, so let's go through exactly how these are assessed. And the, the punchline of it is you get multiple chances for all of these. It's not one and done. You, you, know, you show up late to a quiz. Uh, you slept in one day. Oh, you failed the class. Uh, it's not quite that harsh. Uh, so let's talk about what it actually is. So there are... Uh, six lab quizzes, six lab interviews, and there are three attempts for each one of these. You get three attempts to be able to pass these. And Paul and I talk about this a lot. Like, is three the right number? Like, if you can't finish it in three attempts, like, you, yeah, you need to spend more time in 116. Three attempts is a lot. Um, we talked about going down to two. That seemed a little too harsh. You know, things can happen where you, you do bad. You know, maybe you're feeling under the weather for one of them, and the other one, you had a, you know, a family emergency or something. You know, that seemed a little harsh. I think three is the right number here. Uh, so each quiz has, uh, quiz and interview has a first chance and a second chance labeled on the course schedule. The whole schedule is out right now. You can scroll down on the course website and see the whole schedule of when exactly every quiz and every interview is going to be, every first chance and every second chance. Um, and for a first chance um, quiz, if you get it done, like the first chance quiz and a first chance interview, you get it done on the first chance, you don't need the other two chances. You're done. You already completed that learning objective. These are like check boxes. You checked off quiz one, done. You're done with it. You never have to think about it again. Though you should remember the material, of course. Um, but you don't have to be assessed on that again. Once we say you passed it, you passed it. These are pass-fail. Quizzes and interviews are graded on a pass-fail basis. You do not have to be perfect on any of them to pass them. There are some uh, mistakes that are not directly related to the learning objective that will allow, um, mostly like for memory diagrams, you have syntax errors or something, or you didn't put your return arrow, or you didn't cross out a, a frame. Like, I don't really care about those things. As long as you uh, showed an understanding of the learning objective that's being assessed, uh, that should be a pass. 
Uh, so you have one chance for each one of them. If you don't complete them both on the first chance, there'll be a second chance lab, show up to the second chance lab, do the whole thing again. Um, if, uh, uh, if you, I'm just getting into details here, but if you complete the quiz but not the interview, you would show up to the second chance lab and do just the interview. You don't have to redo the quiz. They are graded separately, so you just have to do the whatever one or ones you missed. Oh, the third, I didn't talk about the third chance at all. The third chance for every single quiz, every single interview, so 12 total learning objectives, you get a third chance, which is on the final exam. So the only purpose of the final exam is to make up these six quizzes and six interviews. There's nothing else being uh, offered on the final exam. So all six quizzes, all six interviews. If for whatever reason throughout the semester you didn't get any of these in the first or second chance, which hopefully nobody's ever going to be in that situation. Um, but if you didn't get any of them, you can show up to the final exam and do all 12 and still get all of these checked off and, and pass them all. Nobody's ever done that. I've had students who needed all of them going into the final exam, but they, they never pass. Like, because obviously, they just haven't studied all semester. Uh, they, they can't really pull that off. Um, but you can uh, technically do that. Uh, more realistically, you got 11 of the 12. You just need that last one. You show up to the final exam. You don't have to do all 12 things on the final exam. You show up. You do that one thing that you're missing. You knock it out of the part because you came prepared this time. Hand it in. Get your credit. Get your passing grade. Done with 116. So you have three chances all the way up to the final exam of the course to be able to get these. So hopefully it's sounding a little less harsh. It's not you show up for the quiz. Oh, you, uh, you missed one of your references, that, that uh, reference there doesn't match that reference there, fail the course. It's not quite that harsh. Uh, you get three chances, and you can make some small errors. OK, and then the eight programming tasks. You have eight programming tasks throughout the semester. And yes, you do have to complete all of these. These are auto-graded, so you get unlimited submissions for each of them, and you have to submit until auto-grader coughs up a 1.0 and says you're good to go. Uh, all eight of these you do have to pass. So you do, of course, it's a programming course. A lot of the assessment is programming. So you're going to be spending a lot of time programming. Or maybe not. Maybe you'll just knock every programming test out of the park, and you can take my seven hours a week and uh, tell me where to stick it and, uh, and just crush everything. I'd love to see that. It's, I mean, some students do that. But usually, it's because they had program experience in high school. Uh, take an AP. AP uh, CS it covers a lot of the material in this course. Uh, because we don't do object-oriented programming in 115, we save all that for 116. So if you did AP CS, um, you know, those students do cruise through the course. But that's not the expectation. I don't expect you to have AP done. All right, so that's how you pass the class. How do I get my A? Uh, so application objectives, separate from the learning objectives, are, are going to be points that you can earn throughout the semester to be able to improve your grade. So if you get all the 12 learning, 18 learning, 20? Do I have the wrong number on there? Oh, I, I didn't put a number. Oh, yeah, I didn't feel like doing the math, so I, I just spelled it all out. But yeah, 20. So if you got all 20 learning objectives, you pass, period. Um, then, depending on how many application objectives you got, including zero, if you got zero of them, you're still passing the class if you've completed all of the learning objectives. Uh, you can earn your way up to an A by learning, earning, learn, oh my goodness, application objectives. So let's talk about how to earn those. And most of the application objectives, um, I think are free. I think they're basically free. You should all get... If you're passing the class and keeping up with the material, these application objectives should just start coming in, should just start rolling in. What I mean by that is most of the application objectives are designed to incentivize you to stay up to date on the material of the course. So if you're staying up to date on everything and not falling behind, you should just start raking in application objectives but with almost no extra effort on your part. Just complete the learning objectives, and if you complete the learning objectives on time, you're getting most of these things. All right, so let's break this down. You got programming tasks. You can earn 16 AOs on the programming tasks. This is eight programming assignments. 
each with three separate deadlines. So let's talk about deadlines. Uh, I said you get three chances for every quiz, three chances for every interview. You also get three chances for every programming task in the form of three separate deadlines. There's a three theme in this course, I'm finding out. Um, there's the expected deadline. This is the very first deadline. This is one week after the content for that task has been covered. So I think uh, the expected deadline, as the name implies, is where we would expect any reasonable student to be done with the programming task. If you're staying up on all the materials, studying, and then spending that week working on the programming tasks, going to office hours, and doing whatever you need to get um, any help if you get stuck, uh, this is where any student should be done. And even Friday, we debated uh, what day of the week it should be. Uh, we used to have it on Wednesday, actually. It'd be two days earlier, but uh, given the office hour schedule, just giving you a full week to be able to hit any office hour that you can make. Some students could only make Thursday office hours. We had deadlines on Wednesday. Anyway, Friday night's the deadline. So Friday night, uh, 11.59 p.m., so right before midnight, um, that's the deadline for all the deadlines. So one week after the content Friday night, that's when you should be done with the tasks. Should be all wrapped up, submitted to Autolab, and Autolab should cough up a one. If you meet that deadline, we're going to throw two application objectives at you. For every single task that you meet the expected deadline, two application objectives, max of 16. If you get all eight done by the expected deadline, 16 application objectives. One week after the expected deadline is the late deadline. So this is kind of your second chance. OK, you missed the expected deadline. One week later, the late deadline. Meet the late deadline, 1 AO. One week after that is the final deadline. These are the scary ones. You don't want to be relying on the final deadlines. Uh, the final deadline, if you get it before the final deadline, zero AOs. You ain't getting nothing for that. Uh, but you do get to still have a chance to pass the class. So if you don't complete the task, any of the eight tasks, by the final deadline, well, you can't complete that learning objective anymore, which means failing the course. Uh, so you need to meet the final deadline to pass. You're heavily encouraged to aim for this expected deadline and get those AOs. You have to complete every single task anyway. I'm always surprised that uh, some students will rely, just aim for the final deadline and rely on that final deadline every time. Like, you have to do the work anyway. Just grab your two AOs. Like, just aim for the expected. Uh, so you're all going to do that, right? You're going to aim for every expected deadline and get your AOs and never have to sweat out a final. If you're working Friday night of a final deadline, I don't want anybody to be in that situation. Get your stuff done earlier. Yep. Yep. Uh, so if you go to the course schedule, every uh, expected, final, late, they're all on the schedule. All right, uh, and, and the reasoning for this, so the expected is one week after the content, late is two weeks after the content, ex, uh, final is three weeks after the content. If you're working on an assignment more than three weeks after that content has been covered, like we're covering a lot of material in those three weeks send, in that time while you're still working on a very old programming assignment, if you fall that far behind, and students who fall that far behind when we had less strict deadlines, students who fall that far behind don't get caught up. You cannot fall three weeks behind in CC 116 and just magically get caught back up. It's not going to happen. If, and I'll be careful with my wording on this one. Some students can do that. They're capable of doing that. But those students generally don't find themselves in that position to begin with. Anyone who finds themselves in a position where they're three weeks behind, they're the same type of student who can't get caught back up. It just doesn't happen. And, um, and we end up just giving them false hope that they can eventually maybe pass the course. Uh, so three weeks, if you're three weeks behind on a programming test, it's done. We've got to cut you off and, and cut off the false hope that you might get through the course. Uh, you just got to try again next semester. Uh, we will give you false hope on quizzes and interviews, though. If you complete all eight programming tasks, we'll still let you take the final and, and have that chance there. Mostly because with programming tasks, you get unlimited submissions. If you're three weeks behind and you still haven't completed it, and you have unlimited submissions, Piazza and office hours, all these resources, like, uh, that's a lot different than showing up to the lab twice and just not doing as well as you thought, not being as prepared as you thought for an interview. That's a lot different than... Uh, 
over the course of three weeks, really four weeks, because you should start working on it during the week the content's covered. Uh, that's, yeah, sorry, we got to cut you off at that point. Yeah. Where, where we limit the number of submissions? Yeah. No. I, I think about it from time to time, maybe someday, but not this semester. We won't limit the number of submissions. So the number of submissions is capped at how many times you can su possibly submit before the last deadline, which, you know, that is a finite number, but it's huge. Uh, only by the laws of physics are you limited, is what I'm saying. Oh, really? I, I don't, I won't do that. <laughs> I, yeah, I don't want to say anything I'll regret, but, but no, I won't do that. Uh, wh when I release the syllabus, when we go over it on day one, like everything's, in my mind, everything's set in stone. I'm not going to make a huge change like that. It's a pretty significant change. Uh, the only changes I'll ever make is if things get easier. I'll never make a change that makes things harder for students. Because that's, that's my contract, my side of the syllabus. I'm going to have to go yell at somebody. I'll, go, I'll yell at Paul, I think. Why would they do that? Mid semester is rough. Okay, still, if you're not expecting that, because uh, they, because realistically, uh, do we have time for a small tangent? Because realistically, the number of submissions should be limited. Like, uh, there's always students who will make hundreds of submissions on a particular assignment. Like that student is doesn't have proper study habits. Like, the, you're not trying to learn the material, applying that material to your program assignment, and then submitting. Like, you're just bashing against the auto grader until it coughs up points at that point. That shouldn't be allowed, but I don't have a great way. Like, limiting it to five, well, what happens when you have a capital L instead of a lowercase l, and you don't notice it in your first four submissions? Like, I don't want that student being punished for that. Um, there, there's just a lot of legitimate reasons somebody can rack up, like, up to 20 or so submissions. So there's no, like, magic number where I can cut you off and say, that's too many. Is there a question up here? Yeah. For, uh, so everything is pass fail, but all the application objectives are discrete numbers. And then it's based on the chart of how many application objectives you completed. So if you complete, uh, like each programming task you get before the expected deadline, you bank two AOs, and then that increases your count as you get closer and closer to that A. We got seven minutes left. Y'all are antsy. <laughs> the, uh, all right, bless you. Uh, there are two additional programming assignments. So in addition to the eight, uh, programming tasks that are your learning objectives. There's two additional ones that are just for AOs. Each one, two AOs. One deadline for these. There's no three deadlines because it's not a pass-fail, the course decision. It's just improving your grade. So just one deadline, just the expected deadline. Um, so four more AOs you can get there. Quizzes and interviews. Oh, the, yeah, we, we got time to do this. Quizzes and interviews. You got three chances for each. We covered that at length. Complete them by the first chance, each one, two AOs. Second chance, one AO. Third chance, if you're relying on the final exam, no AOs for you, but you get a chance to pass the class. Uh, so kind of the same structure uh, as the test. You get three chances for everything. First chance, you get two AOs. Second chance, one. Third chance, zero. Uh, there's one exception to this, the lab absence policy, which, I mean, I guess you can read the whole thing. It takes some explanation. but. Uh, for up to two, bless you, up to two quizzes and or interviews, your second chance can count as your first chance for AO purposes. Uh, so this is to take care of any, you know, um, each lab, most labs are going to be an interview and a quiz. So this is effectively saying one lab. For one lab, you can miss for any reason. We don't care what it is. You can miss one lab, and, and that's fine. One of the first chance labs with no punishment, I don't care why, you were sick, you uh, had to go to someone's wedding, you had a family emergency, your dog was sick, I don't care. I don't care what the excuse is. Everybody gets one free miss uh, for a first chance lab, no questions asked, and it'll all be handed automatically on the back end. Uh, we'll just do that when we calculate AOs at the end of the semester. 
you'll just get your, get your AOs for one. Uh, this can also include if you showed up, took the quiz and interview, and failed them both, then your second chance one time throughout the semester can count as your first try. Um, this is our sick policy, our you know, whatever. I had to go to a conference. I don't care what the reason is. You get one, one free one. Uh, and I don't want uh, emails telling me all your excuses or anything. No, you just use up your free one. The only time I want your email and your doctor's notes or whatever is if you miss two weeks of lab, if you miss both the first attempt and the second attempt or whatever combination it is, uh, then if you have documentation proving that you had to miss two whole labs, uh, then you know, we'll work something out. We'll schedule something outside a lab most likely and give you a, an extra chance to make up for what you missed. But you have to have documentation. You have to show that you actually missed uh, both those labs. A doctor's note that says, yes, this student was sick for that span of eight days that covered both lab sections. Like, I need some serious documentation for that. Uh, this policy should take care of any, uh, any lab excuses so uh, I don't get 100 emails every week for lab. And finally, lecture questions. Each uh, lecture, Starting on Friday is going to have a lecture question. These are intended to be short, simple questions. Um, I think we're sticking with multiple choice this semester. Uh, multiple choice questions submitted on Autolab, uh, which are intended to be very simple. They should be uh, a way of saying, were you here and awake during lecture? If you were, you sh these should be fairly automatic. Uh, if you weren't, then they're going to be fairly difficult. Um, but each lecture will end in one of these lecture questions. We're going to drop nine lecture questions, which this was Paul's number. I think this number is way too high. Um, but nine lecture questions we're going to drop. That's either you weren't here, you missed three full weeks of lecture and just skipped it, or you showed up, answered the question, but got it wrong. Uh, we're going to drop nine of them. And then after the nine drops, if you got every question, all the remaining questions correct, three AOs, if after the nine drops you got missed between one and seven, two AOs. If after the nine drops you missed eight to 14 of them, you get one AO. And if after nine drops you missed more than 14, you're not getting any AOs for lecture questions because, come on, nine drops and 14 misses. If you're doing more than that, like, what are you even doing? Um, and that's all the AOs. Um, and don't cheat. Uh, I'll do an abbreviated speech because I don't have much time, but... Uh, uh, I think the biggest thing I want to highlight is this one. I got the arrow and everything, but sitting next to somebody working on the program, your friend's sitting here, you're sitting here, and you're looking at each other's screen a lot. A lot of the more tragic AI cases that I have in my office where a student breaks down in tears while I'm telling them they failed, uh, it's that case where your code looks so similar just because you work so closely together that your code ended up being almost identical and you didn't necessarily know you were crossing over that line. So the line is if you can see someone else's code or somebody else can see